thanks for the introduction. Well, so I'm a sustainable design student. I went to the bachelor and now I'm, now I'm doing the masters. And uh, today I will just um, see if this works. Um, talk a bit about the format of the education I've been on and uh, how it all correlates together. Um, and then focused a bit more on the project because that is a large part of the sustainable design program. And of course also the group work, like all the dynamics and synergies that need to be in order for you to actually function and create an output. And then, at least from a student's uh, sort of point of view, what the role of the supervisor then becomes when it's PBL you're doing. And then some sort of last remarks. So first off, um, just shortly introduce um, sort of the program. It's about uh, creative uh, design. Uh, courses and subjects. It's also social material theory and dimensions and then the technical qualities of the engineering. So it's both understanding the people you're creating for and with, it's being able to create and it's also having the technical and material knowledge to be able to build and function with that and actually create a functional output, so to speak. Um, so on the education you sort of go from uh, in the beginning product the focus design and then you sort of build up to product uh, product service system and then system design so you sort of have an escalating ladder and that also creates a very good dynamic for the students I think at least for me because you're both able to see the macro picture of a whole infrastructure infrastructure system but also go down to the micro and create small solutions that are part of the big whole so I think that's a very good way of sort of building up the students to be able to perform on different levels this is uh, the actual curriculum for the bachelors, and as you can see, the project, which is the green one, um, is actually half of each semester. So that is quite different, I think, from very, mu very many classical uh, university and approaches, but it works because the project doesn't stand alone. The three courses that you often have, sometimes they are mixed, so you have two, sometimes four, but they are not working independently either. The courses, build up and supports the project and feeds into with methods, knowledge and sort of a building ground for the project. So when you're doing a project, you're actually using the knowledge in the same semester that you're gaining in the other courses and you're using that knowledge from your own project as a sort of working case on how you could do the different things that you learn about. So that synergy, I think, is very good because you go from passive learning to active learning by doing it and uh, trying it off uh, right away. <coughs> so to have an example of this, I just took, uh, this is something from my third semester on the bachelor. So here you have co-design and user interaction, digital signal processing and introduction to programming. And the overall sort of frame is design and the use of prototypes. So we're working with social sustainability this semester with an elderly home. and. So right from the start, you have co-design and user interaction to help you out with how do you do field work, how do you interact with the people that are actually on the site and uh, figure out what the problems you could be working with is. <coughs> and then you build out on top of that, you also feed it back into co-design so you use it when you have uh, classes to sort of use an examples and talk from that uh, user experience already. And then you start using the different methods and so on. You have some design games here and apply them out in the field. Test them off because you're going to thought being sitting down here in the studio, this is an amazing design game or prototype or whatever. This is going to work so well. But when you get out there and test it off and it doesn't work at all, you all of a sudden have to rethink the whole thing. What went wrong? What did I take into account when I did this? And I think you learn a lot from that as a student from just sitting there and thinking this is the best thing in the whole world. So you're sort of humbled by it in a good way. Um, but yeah, we then went on to start using this programming and digital signal processing to actually create some low fidelity prototypes at first. And then we sort of shared the knowledge and built upon that with, in co-design with the people who worked there and ended up with a final solution. And all the while you can see there's a lot of arrows. So you're really have a lot of interaction between the courses throughout the semester, the project, and the collaborative partner and the field that you're working with, which creates a great synergy again. Um, but um, the reason why we have these and the reason why I think they work so well is because a lot of the students uh, use a lot of time here, as Andres also explained. So 
each group would have each a niche, so this would be a niche. And a central part of this is that you work with something called worksheets. You can see you have some of them here. So it's in principle just an A3 paper. Um, where you, in short and precise visual measures, try to elaborate on a certain subject. It can be a field trip, it can be um, a theory method, it can be some knowledge you've gained from a place, and you share it, and it's available all the time. Uh, this makes up, like, it enables a whole group to know a lot without everybody needing to know everything, uh, but still utilize it and use each other's knowledge on it. Throughout the semester, also to sort of navigate that project, we have uh, also milestones. So milestones, each project group would present, okay, where are we at? Uh, and they would have a certain set of goals that sort of said, you should have reached this point, you should have been to the field, you should have figured out what the possible problems are, and you should have maybe chosen one to continue working on. And then you present that and you get feedback from your peers and also the other supervisor, because you might be at a blind spot, you might have something you didn't take into consideration. So knowledge sharing here, also throughout the project, like all together, getting other points of view in, I think is very beneficial for the students to get new points of view, get challenged in the beginning instead of in the end of the project when you're at the exam, and, and sort of take you to another level in terms of uh, reflections while you're doing the actual project. So I'm talking a lot about the project, but um, often um, when you start the project, you gather to together around uh, to be a project group. And then often I would say there's sort of three sort of ways you can go by it. Either you're so lucky that your supervisors uh, have a project or partner. They could be doing a research project that uh, there's something that can be used from. Um, that they want you to um, to sort of engage in and try to find a solution for. You can also be that the students just have an interest in a gen general public uh, problem area and then try to find a collaborative partner later on. Or it can also be that um, I already have an initial contact and possible collaborative partner and then we go from there. But all in all, I think most of the time, I would say nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, you as a student would seek to find a collaborator of some way, of some sort, because it's so important to actually work with real life problems and work with real organizations. So you don't just end up with the, I call them paper projects. You know, when you're just sitting behind your desk for three months and figuring out this is the best way of doing it. You get out in the world, you get to challenge it, and you get to try out some of the things in a real life uh, situation. So it's also understanding the real complexity of the field uh, that you're engaged in, and it, it's actually learning to use your skills and knowledge in that field, because often you would end up knowing that what you learn in class, you can't take like one-to-one -one onto the field and use it. You would need to adapt it, and you learn that by doing it. So it's also, I think, important for students, why you would have a collaborative partner to have <coughs> real response to challenges. Like you actually create a difference. You can see it impacts people when you find solution for them. And that creates a lot of the drive for the students to actually engage and do more in a project work and also in studying. And most importantly, it's also to learn to fail and learn from it. Because I think many students, at least in my generation, are very scared of failing. But you really learn that through this way of doing it because you understand that you can never do it the perfect way and there's no sol one solution that you can just put out there and then everything's gonna be fine. So you learn to fail and you learn to catch up on it and see, okay, what can I do differently and better? Um, so out of this, you learn being humble, um, both in terms of collaborative partner, but also in group works that one size doesn't fit all. Like, this is my sixth semester. Uh, some pictures from that, we were working with some maker spaces and we were working with some public schools and some private schools of how they could, uh, the schools could integrate uh, digital production um, tools like uh, 3D printers, laser cutters in teaching about innovation and technology for 12 year olds. Uh, 12 year olds. Um, and we pretty quickly learned that First of all, one size doesn't fit all in this project. We had a private school and two public schools and they had completely different needs. And we needed to adapt theory and methods from 
not only the mega space but also from like the learning environment so how can we integrate all these and put them together in a way that is meaningful for everybody so they can actually create a positive output so it's also about combining different fields of knowledge and utilize them and you really gain that from uh, from doing these kind of projects um, so yeah I'm gonna move on to a bit of group work because of course when you're doing three months together sitting here for what is equivalent to like a full-time job you really need it to work <laughs> because otherwise it's gonna be a long long journey but um, I think the best analogy is actually to say that you're going on a journey like sailing out because you need to prepare for the journey you need to pick up and use, figure out what theories, what methods you wanted to use. You need to have some basic knowledge of the place you're going and the people you're gonna interact with. And then you need to plot an initial course. Where do we wanna end up with this? And you need to agree on that, of course. But most prominently, you need to expect and be able to act on the unexpected. Again, being adaptable because there could be unforeseen things just around the corner. And often you would need to not only go straight forward, but also sometimes go back, gather new provision, new knowledge or new theories to be able to function and move forward. Um, and hopefully you would end up at a finish line, maybe the, not the one you expected, but that much richer from the process. This also means that you have different roles in a project. And I think a band analogy is the best way I could explain that. So here we go. I hope you can get go with me on it. So why is it like playing in a band? Because I think too many of the same instruments, like if you only have drums or you only have uh, guitars or only lead singers, ah, it doesn't really work. You need to be very good at make it, for making it work. So you need to have diversity, but you also need to be able to uh, sort of be in synergy and work together. Uh, and I think that's very important for, uh, for students at least to acknowledge like, you're good at this and you're able to do this, but you should also know how I do my thing because otherwise we can't utilize each other's uh, expertise and knowledge. Then it's also agreeing on the genre. If somebody is just going one direction completely with 200 miles an hour and the others, others are sort of, okay, but we rather do this, then it doesn't work. Um, last semester I was working with agriculture in Denmark and sustainable transition of that. And I think until a month in, we didn't, wasn't quite agreeing on, okay, what do we actually mean when we say Danish agriculture? Is it the medicine industry then also? Is it also uh, like logistics or is it just like the fields and the farmers themselves? So it's really important also to be able to agree on the genre, how we're playing, how we're synergizing for it to function together. And then there's of course the style and rhythm because people have many ways of doing project works. And I think if you do PBL, you also experience that with the, the students you have because some have family as at home, some have full-time job on the side or part-time jobs. And if the group aren't able to sort of make that work play in the same rhythm, it can be really hard to keep everybody in sync and don't, no, not leaving anybody behind. But if you make that work, um, then you really have a good group. You can really perform, everybody contributes and everybody feels like they fit in and you might get some like really essential things that you wouldn't have if you were just playing separately. Because you can be a great singer and songwriter, but if you have a band and you play with each other and learn from each other, use each other, you can really become that much more than just a singer and songwriter uh, by yourself. So I think that is really, this sort of essential benefit of doing um, the group work and being able to utilize the different roles there are in group work. So, what students gain from the projects? I've been over this, so I don't think, think I'm gonna go through it again. But maybe just the last one. Students become really eager to explore and understand when you do real life projects. Like we went to Italy last semester to learn about different kinds of organizing uh, agriculture in a more sustainable way. And we went there because why not? They have the knowledge, so we need to go there and see and find out what that is. So you want, as a student, you get students who want to explore, who want to understand, who wants to take in new kinds of knowledge and integrate it into what they're studying. 
Um, and you also get students that are able to navigate this complexity and uncertainty. But maybe not always by themselves, so that's why you still have the role of the supervisor, uh, which is not negligible. So, of course, the supervisor's role is guiding the group, but there are many ways of guiding, and I think one of the main things is being available but not present. You shouldn't like control or micromanage a project group. It's more important that you are able to sort of give them inputs, steer them in the general directions, but they should do the work. If you're there all the time or really making sure that they're doing exactly as we all planned a month ago, then you're going to ruin the whole thing for them. They need to learn by themselves. Um, so it's orienting them if they are lost or they get too much, of course. So there should be a spectrum. And that is also why worksheets that you can also experience when you go down or you can have them send them to them to you um, and the milestones are important because then you know but it's also to challenge the students and say well I know that you had this course and you learned about this way of doing it but maybe do it slightly different or have a look at this article or this way of doing it and see if that couldn't do anything good for you so it's also pushing and supporting them at the same time and it's really a hard equi equilibrium to fit or find, but when you find it, it can really do a lot for the students. Then the supervisor as an enabler, because the students are very independent when they do this project, and I think our supervisors are maybe we maybe have an an hour a week meeting with them. Maybe we send some material for them to read. So you can't expect to know everything about what they're doing, and you shouldn't. Um, but you still have a very important role as a supervisor, as the enabler, because you have a, a really large network of people that might know exactly what they need or that you yourself go and ask if you have something you're in doubt about. And you should be knowledgeable about how could my students maybe utilize this other professor's knowledge or this article, or this thing. So you have a large knowledge pool that you should be able to sort of draw upon and not be afraid of, of putting to them. So this is also suggesting alternative routes and sort of. So you should enable them to do their thing uh, through you and what you have already done. So all the while, also this makes the supervisor, it's essential sort of that they have at least some connection to the field that the students are working with. Otherwise it can be hard uh, to actually um, supervise, <laughs> I guess. But being that central or be having this sort of, uh, I would say, maybe bigger role to play in, the, in doing this project uh, students do, it also means that the supervisor have a somewhat bigger commitment. Uh, it also means that you will often end up using more time than you expected. But I think you also gain a lot from it. If you're doing research in a field and the students are working on some of the things that you are, you can really gain from investing that time in them and understanding them and leading them in the right direction or helping them out because you can gain a lot from it and they can gain it even more. But lastly, it's maybe most important that you are able to acknowledge that you don't know the answers to everything because um, as a supervisor, I think, at least when I started, I expected the supervisors to know everything. Every course I had, every article I read, why don't you know this? Um, but you shouldn't and you should be honest about it. And the only thing you can do better than saying, I don't know, is that you maybe have, are able, because of your network, because of your large knowledge pool, to find that answer or at least point them in the general direction of how they can find it. And I think that is the most important role as an enabler for the students and can really get them far just by doing that. So, why people as a student? You go from passive to active learning, learning by doing again. You get the ability to think on your feet. You're not stuck behind the last calculations. You're adaptable, you're ready, you're dynamic, and you can work. Um, and you can transform knowledge into action. So it's not just dry theories and um, sort of uh, methods. It's actually something you have on your backbone that you can use also when you get out on the other side for work or whatever you want to do. 
you get a large ownership and commitment as a student and you are able to navigate in real world scenarios even when there are a lot of uncertainties and complexities that you are not able to take into account at first. But most importantly, you are able to work and thrive with transdisciplinarity, which I think is becoming more and more important. And you are able to be independent and take initiative when they're needed. I think my time is up. Isn't it? So, thank you.